The next item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 11431 in the name of Christine Graham on a shocking way to treat a dog. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to participate could press the request to speak buttons now, please. I call on Christine Graham to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to thank all members who signed my motion to ban the use of electronic shock collars on dogs and cats. I'd also convey the apologies of Claudia Beamish, who very much supports a ban but cannot be here to debate. I also say to those who have not signed the motion, come along to Committee Room 1 today and try one on yourself. Members of the press, too, are welcome to take up the challenge. Your neck is spared, but not your wrist. You see, if you chicken out, then you're actually saying, I don't want the pain of this, but it's OK for dogs and cats. That doesn't say much for you. Of course, if you have supported my, the motion, you are excused. Otherwise, you will certainly be on my name and shame list. Now, why bring this motion? Well, as chair of the cross-party group on animal welfare, we put our money where our mouth is, and we decided we wished this issue debated. As with others, including Elaine Murray and Alison Johnson, I've put down a sequence of parliamentary questions in pursuit of a ban and to flush out the government's reasons for opposing a ban. I also recognise the commitment of my colleague Kenny Gibson to this issue. The Scottish Government is maintaining its position that DEFRA research does not support the proposition that the effect of these devices does either long-term or significant harm to dog welfare but further takes the view that collars should be used, quotes, responsibly, responsibly. That was parliamentary answer of the 27th of June last year. Obviously, I disagree with the Scottish Government's position, as does the Welsh Assembly, which banned the use in 2010, where usage can make you liable for quite severe penalties, up to 51 weeks imprisonment, a fine of up to £20,000, or both. This was done by regulation under the animal welfare legislation, and the same could be done here. The Welsh ministers only made their decisions after receiving advice from the Chief Veterinary Officer for Wales and based on evidence from consultations and DEFRA research. That legislation was challenged by the Electronic Collar Manufacturers Association, as you would expect. They lost, and the ban remains. The mystery to me is why the Scottish Government adheres to its view. But it's not just Wales. Count in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Austria, Germany, Slovenia and most states in Australia all have banned the use of electronic shock collars. How can it possibly be defended to send an electronic shock through a dog or cat's neck for, quotes, training, quotes, purposes? Shock collars can also perversely cause further behavioural problems. A dog may associate the ele electric shock with other events at the same time with unintended consequences, such as per perhaps attacking other dogs. I've had pet animals for over 40 years myself and would never countenance using pain to train. Quite the opposite. Despite the different temperaments of my pet cats and dog over the years, I've found kindness and patience through understanding the animal's behaviour has allowed training to be successful. This indeed is a policy followed by my sequence of cats who have long since got the measure of me and having observed my behaviour and seen what works for them, trained me over the years without the use of a shock collar. But let's park personal anecdote and sentiment and go for hard facts. DEVRA, in its funded studies published in 2013, concluded that there was a great variability in how shock collars were used on dogs and that owners tended either not to read or not to follow instructions. So the main conclusion was that there were significant welfare consequences for some of the dogs. By the way, it's easy enough to buy these devices online. Prices ranging from around £20 to in the hundreds. Goodness knows who is buying them, if they bother to read the manual and how and where they are being used. I suspect if you or I saw one being applied in public, we would be appalled. Deputy Presiding Officer, not only does 73% 73 of the public disapprove of the use of these devices, 74% would support a ban. But I know a group of 100% who would vote against him, and they really say it better 
than myself or any other politician. And here's what they have to say. In trials, one in four dogs showed signs of stress. It will make dogs sad. If you have a shock collar, you're a bad person. Why shock a dog when you can train them to do good things? Stop hurting, my friends. Imagine getting shocked for up to 30 seconds. You wouldn't like it. The majority of people love pets, but some people take it way too far. Yes, dogs and cats can make mistakes, just like us, really, but that doesn't give you the right to zap them in the neck, does it? If I was in this debate, I'd vote to ban them forever. These are the voices of Primary 7 at Morris Wood Pennycook. And I have to say to the Minister, if the government remains obdurate, I give notice in this chamber that I feel a campaign coming on. I've got colleagues across parties, I think, who would support that campaign. And not only supported by colleagues here in the Morriswood Pupils, but remember, the vast majority of the public. And the offer remains open to members of the parliament and their staff and the press and anyone else. If you think a shock collar and a dog or a cat is just fine and dandy, come and try one on yourself later today in committee room one. And I think you'll change your mind. Thank you, presiding officer. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. If members keep to their four minutes, I should be able to call everyone. Uh, I call Elaine Murray to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I first of all would like to congratulate Christine Graham on securing this debate on, and on draw, drawing attention to the continued use of this unacceptable practice of using sh electric shock collars to attempt to control the behaviour of dogs, and actually even more surprisingly, of cats. My colleague Maureen McMillan proposed an amendment to the Animal Health and Welfare Act in 2006 in the hopes of banning these devices, and at the time Ross Finney, who was the Minister, stated that ministers wanted instead to co uh, issue a consultation on the use of these devices. And he also suggested that um, the Act provided for Scottish ministers to make regulations to ban them under Section 23 of the Act. Now, I do not know whether the consultation uh, Ross Finney suggested was actually ever carried out, but the devices certainly haven't been banned almost nine years on, on although they were banned in Wales in 2010. And I wonder, in summing up, this debate, whether the Minister can indicate whether there has been any consultation on the use of electric shock collars, and if so, what the conclusions were. The administration of pain as a training method for dogs is predicated on an outdated view of dog behaviour, which itself is based on a misconception of wolf behaviour. Studies of unrelated wolves in captivity in the mid-20th century gave rise to the popular theory that the wolf packs consisted of a pair of alpha wolves whose status in the pack had to be continuously reinforced or else they would be overthrown by one of the beta wolves who wanted their job. Now, most recent studies of wild related wolves in, uh, actually in the wild indicate that they live in extended family packs with one breeding pair, which are otherwise be known as parents. The consequence of the application of this model based on wolves and captivity to dogs with millennia of socialisation with and selective breeding by humans has been the notion that unless the human owner continually demonstrates that he or she is the boss, the dog will overthrow them and become the top dog, uh, leader of the household, and that the human therefore has to continually exert their authority by force. In fact, dogs have evolved a surprisingly complex system of communication with humans over the millennia. They are happy to accept food and warmth from us, and they actually show no desire to undertake our responsibilities. And unless you see a Jack Russell Chihuahua uh, cross dog sitting in my chair, sometimes I suspect that will continue to do so. Dogs respond to positive reinforcement and reward. If a dog displays challenging or threatening behaviour, it has probably not been trained to use peaceful and acceptable methods of communication, and it is most likely that its owner has actually themselves used aggressive and violent methods of control. Sudden unexpected pain, such as that caused by an electric shock, will frighten and confuse a dog and is likely to cause it to panic, and then the dog may become aggressive. The dog may not accept, associate the behaviour for which it is being punished with the pain caused, uh, and recurrent pain in dogs has been shown to increase levels of cortisol, a hormone associated with stress response. One of the purposes of the use of shock collars is controlled barking. Now, barks, dogs bark to communicate with each other, to indicate that their home is their territory, and to communicate with people, perhaps telling us that another dog or person is in the vicinity. 
or it may be that the dog uh, wants attention is, or is lonely or bored. Excessive bank barking may be very annoying, but no dog actually intends to annoy by barking or barks from devilment. Rather than shocking the dog for reasons it won't understand, the reason for its barking should be analysed, addressed and discouraged, and there are many ways of discouraging a dog from excessive barking, though they're not always successful, I have to say. I am certain that this is an animal welfare issue. We ought to have banned these devices years ago. We must return to continue at considering a ban, either using Section 23 of the Animal Welfare Act, as was suggested back in 2006, or through any forthcoming legislation on responsible dog ownership, because I believe there will be an announcement on the results of that consultation soon. Many thanks. I now call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I can I begin by thanking my colleague Christine Graham for securing the time to debate this important matter and the Dogs Trust Kennel Club and One Kind for their comprehensive briefings. I have a keen interest in animal welfare and over the past uh, few years in conjunction with Dogs Trust and the Kennel Club I have organised a number of uh, uh, dog related um, events in my constituency and indeed here in Parliament. Um, Cruel training methods, including the continued use of electri electronic train devices, are abhorrent. And in, since my election in, in 2007, I have raised this matter on a number of occasions with Scottish ministers with a view to having these cruel devices banned. Frankly, I have been disappointed by the responses received over the years uh, and the debating tactics which uh, appear to me to have been uh, imposed. I hope that the new minister will take a fresh and more positive approach to this issue. Electronic train devices, or e-calls, as they are most commonly known, are used primarily uh, to establish obedience, correct behaviour and prevent straying over designated boundaries. In essence, this is accomplished as we have heard, through administering an electric shock either manually or automatically through the collar when a dog behaves in a way its owner or trainer does not approve of. While some dog owners swear by such training methods, there is no doubt that the practice is cruel and can result in more complex and dangerous behavioural conditions. Out of ignorance, many assume that e-calls provide a light electronic pulse which will barely register with a dog but provide enough of a cunt to be deemed uncomfortable. Sadly, this is uh, completely untrue, and if members uh, take up uh, uh, Christine's offer, I'm sure they will find that out for themselves. A small industry sprung up around the manufacture of such devices, and many products are now highly sophisticated, with multiple levels of shock and vibration, depending on how stubborn the animal might be. Uh, and, uh, but those um, who, who actually have actually um, experienced this will know just how distressing uh, this must be for an animal unable to escape from a collar strapped around its neck. Worryingly, evidence provided by DEFRA shows that many owners who purchase these devices do not consult the instructions properly and often guesstimate their own dog's stubbornness and settle electronic pulses as they see fit. While it's not favour any half measures and remain in favour of a complete ban on e-collars, allowing untrained individuals to use them on animals is tremendously worrying and surely underpins the need for legislative action. As we know from uh, Mr Pavlov's experiments, dogs can be conditioned and ultimately trained by introducing positive and negative stimuli. Dogs Trust and the Kennel Club are of the firm opinion that positive methods whereby dogs are rewarded for good behaviour is the best and most efficient and most humane way to train a dog. Evidence provided by these charities shows the negative stimuli provided by e-collars can lead to serious problems. For example, dogs often wrongly associate something in the environment with the shock they have received. This can lead to dogs becoming aggressive towards other animals and individuals and result in confusion, phobia, defensiveness and ultimately non-compliance. When for millennia conventional and positive training methods have prevailed, it seems strange to me that owners would choose to adopt such a cruel and ineffective method of training their dog. And many of our European neighbours, as Christine pointed out, have chosen to ban these collars, uh, despite the, this being contested by the manufacturers of the devices uh, themselves. Unfortunately, I do not feel the guidance provided by the Scottish Government, while well intentioned, goes far enough, and we know that the public uh, support a ban. I, along with compulsory mi microchipping, frankly, I do not understand why the Scottish Government is dragging its feet uh, on this issue, and I feel it is now surely time for the government to follow the lead of the Welsh Assembly and our European neighbours and introduce a ban on the sale and use of these devices in Scotland. Thank you very much. And I now call Nanette Millen, who will be followed by Dennis Robertson. 
Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I welcome the Minister to her new position, as this is the first time I've, I've met her in debate since her recent promotion. Um, Presiding Officer, I too would like to congratulate Christine Graham on bringing forward this member's debate and commend her ongoing work in this area. Even as a well-known cat lover, Christine Graham has long taken an active interest in dog welfare issues. It's clear from the various debates we've had held in this Parliament recently that there are a number of important issues relating to dog welfare and the responsible ownership of dogs in Scotland. And I'd like to thank the many organisations who provided briefings for us, including the Kennel Club, the Dogs Trust and One Kind. The use of electric collars on cats and dogs has been controversial for some time, as we've heard. Indeed, the Scottish Government consulted on their use as far back as 2007, but did not recommend a ban at that time. More recently, as has been mentioned, the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, has conducted research into the effects of shock collars. While this did not reveal evidence that electric collars cause long-term harm to dogs when used appropriately, it did highlight a number of issues relating to the manufacture and regulation of collars to ensure a high standard and proper use. Its report highlighted that the use of e-collars can lead to a negative impact on welfare, at least in a proportion of animals trained using this technique. It also found that a large number of owners using the devices did so without adhering to the accompanying instruction manuals. Since the study was published, it's my understanding that DEFRA has started work with the Electronic Collar Manufacturers Association to provide guidance for dog owners and trainers on how to use these collars properly. It's also working with the Department for Business Information and Skills to produce a manufacturer's charter to ensure the devices are made to high welfare standards. As a dog owner myself, I have no experience of using such training collars and I've never considered using them. And I note that a study undertaken by the University of Lincoln, Lincoln involving the ECMA found that there were no more, they were no more effective than other methods of training, such as giving rewards. I understand, of course, the concerns expressed by many animal welfare charities that electric shock collars may fail to, address, to fail to address underlying behavioural problems or indeed may cause further behavioural complications in dogs. And I would emphasise the advice that anyone considering using such collars should seek professional advice, for example, from their vet before doing so. It's, of course, up to individual dog owners to ensure that... Uh, pinch, prong or shock collars are used appropriately and anyone using them to inflict unnecessary suffering may be prosecuted under animal welfare laws. But the issue is controversial and I know a number of very responsible dog owners who've used electric dog collars over many years and have found no problems with them. So to some extent I feel the jury is still out on this but I do hope the Scottish Government will keep a watching brief on emerging research and experience in other countries and consider further action if it seems appropriate. As I stated earlier, a significant number of dog welfare and ownership issues have been raised in Parliament recently, and I was pleased that the Scottish Government agreed to my request to undertake a consultation on the compulsory microchipping of dogs in Scotland and other relevant matters. That consultation, which took place following an excellent and well-attended summit meeting early last year, saw one of the largest responses to any Scottish Government consultation, clearly demonstrating a high level of public concern. A report on the analysis of these responses was published in October, and I am disappointed by the lack of progress since then on taking forward further measures to promote responsible dog ownership in Scotland. I know that many organisations and constituents also want to see action taken on issues ranging from dog welfare to the indiscriminate breeding of dogs in socially rented properties, the sale of puppies via the internet, and the issue of electric dog collars could also be considered in this context. So to conclude, Presiding Officer, in responding to the debate, it would be helpful that the Minister could outline what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the consultation on promoting responsible dog ownership in Scotland and what plans it has to address the many issues of concern to dog lovers, given that no mention was made of this in the Scottish Government's programme for government announced recently by the new First Minister. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Dennis Robertson to be followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, <clears throat> I, I too would like to thank Christine Graham for bringing this uh, debate to the Chamber. Um, but can I say that, you know, Nanette Milne has um, uh, made reference to appropriate use of electronic dog collars. There is no such thing as an appropriate use of electronic dog collars. Um, I know the jury is out, but as far as I'm concerned, any uh, infliction of pain on an animal is abhorrent, should never happen, and there's no need for it to happen. Regardless of the dog behaviour, 
there are many other methods of trying to ensure that a dog responds positively to the owner's wishes. Presenting officer, I've had six guide dogs, and I'm very fortunate because the dogs are generally well-trained before uh, guide dog owners like myself actually take responsibility for that dog. But if you don't keep up that positive aspect, that positive training, that positive reinforcement, generally through reward, maybe good voice management, maybe just a cuddle, a pat, or sometimes uh, the occasional dog biscuit, um, you know, that, that's the sort of behaviour that we, we would all expect of responsible dog ownership. I too, like Kenny Gibson and others, have um, spoken with the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead, about the uh, microchipping. And, and I feel that the Cabinet Secretary is sympathetic to this, but we need action, not sympathy. And as far as the, the, a complete ban is concerned with the electronic dog collars, that's what we should have. There is no half measure here, presiding officer. We must ban the use of these collars. There is no need for it. Inflicting pain in any kind of control to try and get behaviour to change isn't right. We know that through our children. We, we, are, we, we think it's abhorrent to smack a child. We think it's abhorrent to use corporal punishment in schools. It's banned. Now, I'm not trying to have the parallel between a, a dog and a child. But dogs respond positively to good, positive reward. I, I have never had the, the, I have never had to use any kind of negative control over any dog I have owned. Partly because it's well trained, but partly because I reinforce that positive behaviour. Because my safety, when I'm out with my dog, is 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 my priority. And if I neglect to give the dog that positive reinforcement, that positive rewards, then I'm impairing my own safety. Presenting officer, I remember many years ago, we were actually we were doing a training video to try and to, to show how we could train a person uh, who was deaf blind with, a, with a, an assistance dog. And the police were called in because the, the person was actually giving the dog positive reinforcement at the edge of a curb by patting the dog on the chest. But a member of the public thought that the person was actually hitting the dog. So I believe out there in the wider community, the public are responding, I think, to poor uh, uh, dog control or poor ownership of any of our pets. The public are supportive of a ban on these electronic collars, uh, collars and I support it. Can I say that I, I'm not convinced that we need to go down the same route as the Welsh Assembly and have the penalties that they actually have within uh, the, the, the legislative programme that they have. I think penalties need to be appropriate. But if we're going to ban the collars, then they need to go. My problem with the penalty aspect is how do we police and monitor it? And to finish off, presiding officer, and I know that the chamber doesn't like uh, stunts in the, in the chamber, presiding officer, and this is not meant as a stunt. It's meant as a positive reward. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you very much. I now call Cara Hilton to be followed by Alison Johnston. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by congratulating Christine Graham, Graham on securing today's debate on an extremely important animal welfare concern. Can I also add my congratulations to the Welsh Assembly for the action they've taken to ban the use of electric collars for cats and dogs leading the way in the UK. And as Christine Graham has already pointed out, electric shock collars are already banned in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, Slovenia, and in many Australian states. And it comes as no surprise that many most animal welfare organisations fully support a ban, including the Scottish SPCA, the Scottish Kennel Club, Guide Dogs for the Blind and the Dogs Trust. The public are behind a ban too, with a kennel club survey finding that three out of four Scots are against electric collars, with the same proportion supporting a Scottish Government ban on their use. So I believe that the time is right now for the Scottish Government to follow in Wales's footsteps, to listen to the concerns of animal welfare organisations and to respond to public demand by taking action to ban um, these cruel and um, unacceptable devices um, in Scotland. 
Across the UK, an estimated 500,000 dog owners use these inhumane collars, which can deliver an electric shock to their pets, lasting as long as 30 seconds. If anyone wants to experience the pain for themselves, and Christine Graham has already invited MSPs and members of the press to pop along to Committee Room two, uh, 1 after this debate and try a collar out for themselves. When researching this speech last night, a quick search on Amazon revealed that I could buy a fully rechargeable, wireless, remote-controlled shock collar for less than £25. And if I wanted a deluxe model, I could get one for £59.95 with 50 groups of warning tones and 99 different levels of what it describes as static pulse stimulation corrections. Both models are described as safe, reliable and a humane way to treat your, train your dog. The deluxe model even bo boosts, boasts that it takes the human element out of what it describes as a correction, letting you control your dog from 1,200 metres away. The reality is electric shock collars aren't safe or reliable and they're certainly not humane. These are devices that rely on painful punishment, causing dogs to live in constant fear of being electrocuted for what's normal dog behaviour like barking, training them to respond out of fear of punishment rather than a natural willingness to obey, causing unnecessary suffering, with all the evidence suggesting that dogs wearing collars can suffer physical pain and injury, psychological distress, severe anxiety, emotional harm and displaced aggression. Animals too will vary in their pain thresholds and what is a mild shock to one dog might be a severe shock to other. Scientists at the University of Bristol and Lincoln and the Food and Environment Research Agency concluded that the use of electric shock collars can lead to a negative impact on welfare, at least in a proportionate number of animals trained using this technique. They found that many owners use the devices without reading or following the instructions at all, many totally unaware of the high levels of pain they are causing their dogs. A follow-up study by the Lincoln team which was in conjunction with the Electronic Collars Manufacturers Association, found that the devices are no more effective than using, than training, for training dogs than rewarding good behaviour, um, as Dennis Robertson has already demonstrated. The Association of Pet Behaviour Counselors advises that the use of devices that rely on pain or discomfort to control behaviour is inappropriate, advising that it's got the potential to seriously compromise the welfare of dogs and ruin their relationship with owners. So all the evidence shows that these collars are not only inhumane and unacceptable, they're also counterproductive, undermining the relationship between owners and their pets. And I hope that the Minister will listen to the genuine concerns expressed across the Chamber today. We need a lot more than guidance. We need concrete action to protect Scotland's dogs and cats. And we need a ban on the sale, use, distribution and possession of these cruel, harmful, inhumane and, above all, totally unnecessary electric shock collars in Scotland. Thank you very much. And our final open debate speaker is Alison Johnston. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful to Christine Graham for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. As Deputy Convener of the Cross Party Group on Animal Welfare, I've enjoyed working with parliamentary colleagues, and member organisations, and individuals on a variety of issues. But I'm really pleased that this important issue is being discussed in the Chamber. I support a complete ban on electric collars and I'd like to thank all those who are involved in campaigning on this issue, the Kennel Club, the Dogs Trust, One Kind and many other organisations and individuals. Animal welfare concerns many people in this country greatly. I've had the, the pleasure and privilege of, of growing up alongside a variety of rescue cats and dogs and I take their physiological and psychological welfare very seriously. And there's such a large body of evidence highlighting the detrimental impact electric shock collars have on dog and cat welfare. We really do need to follow the example the Welsh Government has set. Their example here is one we must follow and as quickly as possible. This issue has been raised in Westminster too. An early day motion in 2013 pointed out that the DEFRA funded research showed that electric shock collars on dogs not only caused negative behavioural and psychological changes in a portion of dogs, but weren't more effective than positive reinforcement methods, which is the main argument for their use. I mean, why on earth do we persist? Surely it's more effective and humane to build a relationship of mutual trust and liking. And this can be done by positive rewards-based training as we've heard. Um, we can ask, as Conservative MP Matthew Oxford did, why the Department for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs continues to ignore its own research. But we as a parliament here don't have to continue to go along with that. We can do something different. 
we really can put into legislation our commitment to animal welfare. We've been debating the kind of Scotland we want to be in recent months, and I think we want to be the kind of Scotland that puts animal welfare at the top of the agenda. And I think that responsible dog ownership will never include the use of a shock collar. And I, I think, you know, we have a situation where, in using electric shock collars, we have a situation where the presence of the owner announces the reception of a shock and of pain. What sort of relationship is that? We really do need to change the law. We can't simply ignore the fact that dogs are being subjected to short and sharp or prolonged electric shocks to correct what some people might see as undesirable behaviour. Um, Elaine Murray pointed out that some of these undesirable behaviours are perfectly natural, like barking. And I would suggest that anyone considering using a collar should educate themselves first. The briefings we've received today really do say it all. The Kennel Club tell us that unwanted behaviour in dogs is always best resolved by positive training methods that there is enough evidence, the Welsh Assembly agreed that there was enough evidence to prove that banning these devices would improve animal welfare. Well, if that is the case in the Welsh Assembly, I'd like to understand what is different here. You know, the studies that have taken place already highlight the physiological effects, the psychological effects, the impact on learning, and none of these are positive. It really is time that we thought about the message we want to give in Scotland. Really, I think it's fair to say that colleagues have, have outlined the, the many issues surrounding these, col these collars. One kind highlight the fact that this is a tool with the potential to cause significant pain and distress to an animal, and it's available without any follow-up control whatsoever. In, in closing, um, presiding officer, I would like us to, to bear in mind what Mahatma Gandhi said, that the greatness of a nation can be judged by the way its animals are treated. And I want to live in a Scotland where unnecessary animal cruelty is intolerable and unacceptable. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, can I now invite Aileen MacLeod to respond to the debate. Minister, around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding officer. And uh, can I uh, start by thanking Christine Graham for bringing forward uh, this debate and uh, for allowing me to uh, clarify the Scottish Government's position on the use of electronic training aids on dogs uh, in Scotland. But I also want to thank all of those members uh, who have spoken in this debate uh, this afternoon and for their very thoughtful and uh, passionate contributions which I have listened to uh, very uh, carefully. And I'd also like to uh, just thank um, the, uh, different, the various uh, animal welfare organisations like the Kennel Club, the Dogs Trust and One Kind for their very helpful and comprehensive briefings uh, as well. Now, as members are aware, the Scottish Government um, conducted a public consultation on the use, sale, distribution and possession of electronic training aids in 2007. Now, the results of that consultation showed that this is a very sensitive and controversial issue with some animal welfare organisations being strongly opposed to the use of these aids and other organisations being strongly in favour of these aids. And the arguments against the use of electronic training aids are very much around the fact that the devices can cause pain and distress as we've heard this afternoon, the devices fail to address underlying behavioural problems and that they leave the root cause of some problems like barking suppressed and the devices can malfunction or they can be used irresponsibly or in an abusive way. Kenneth Gibson. I'm just wondering which animal welfare organisations are in favour of retaining electronic shock collars. Minister. Well, I'm just going to come on to discuss um, very much around um, the arguments in favour and the arguments against. And I know that there are a number of organisations that are very much against the use of electronic training aids. But then the arguments in favour of those aids are that much of the research has used a type of collar that's no longer in production, that the modern devices use a lower voltage and that they can produce a mild tingle or a warning noise that collars can be fitted with an automatic timeout so that the shock or pulse does not continue. And in some cases, training aids have been used to stop dogs worrying sheep. 
so saving them from having to be put down. Now, the responses to our consultation indicated that arguments for and against the use of these training aids were finally balanced with anecdotal evidence on both sides. Dennis Robertson. Uh, yeah, I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Surely, if we're talking about dogs worrying sheep, it's the responsibility of the dog owner to ensure that their dog is on a lead and you don't require a shot collar. Minister, could I ask you to speak to the microphone when you responded to the intervention? Many thanks. Uh, my colleague makes a, a, very, a very good point uh, around um, the uh, animal, animals if they're, getting, if they're annoying the sheep, so I do accept that point. In terms of the Welsh position, the Welsh Assembly, as Christine Graham points out, brought forward legislation which banned the use of electronic training aids in Wales under the Animal Welfare Electronic uh, Collars Wales Regulations 2010 in March 2010, and that followed a review of the existing science on the topic conducted by the University of Bristol in 2006, three consultations and discussions with the European Commission. And this legislation, as we know, was unsuccessfully challenged by the electronic collar industry in a judicial review. Now, as other members have also highlighted in terms of DEFRA, they did commission for the research from the Universities of Lincoln and Bristol in the form of Project AW1402, where studies to assess the effect of pet training aids, specifically remote static pulse systems, on the welfare of domestic dogs and the add-on project AW1402A field study of dogs in training. Now, the welfare experts have been advising the Scottish Government and DEFRA who have considered the research in full detail and in full context. They confirm that although that research project AW1402A did find that there were some behavioural signs associated with stress during the training of dogs with electronic collars, that the full range of other behavioural and psychological monitoring that was done didn't at that point show significant differences compared with dogs trained without using electronic collars. And that that part of the project also didn't provide evidence around the long-term adverse effects in dogs trained with electronic collars in accordance with manufacturers' instructions. Not, now, a report from... Christine Graham. Thank you very much. You see, the government keeps returning to this uh, usage in terms of the manufacturer's instructions. You see, what gets to me is, I mean, I'm opposed to them in principle, but even if one were to accept that they should be used appropriately, who's monitoring it? Who's policing it? Who's going into somebody's house and checking that they're using it occasionally for training purposes and perpetually using it or putting it to high voltage, as my colleague Cara Hilton has said, they can come with all kinds of voltages in them. So it really cannot be policed. That's can I hurry the issue. Along, please, Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, Christine Graham for that point, which uh, I will take on board. But also just in terms of, because I'm conscious of time, that there was a report that was from the Companion Animal Welfare Council entitled The Use of Electro Electric Pulse Training Aids in Companion Animals that was prepared and published in June 2012, which consisted of the systematic review of peer-reviewed scientific publications. Now, that report did make some useful recommendations around the design and use of electronic aids that can be considered. And also, the Scottish Government supports the work that DEFRA has already been undertaking to take some of these recommendations forward and the Scottish Government and DEFRA concluded that a ban on electronic training aids couldn't be justified on welfare grounds at this time but that the improved guidance for owners and trainers was the appropriate uh, way forward. Now in terms of going forward I mean, we fully support the work that DEFRA is undertaking with the Electronic Collar Manufacturers Association to draw up the guidance for dog owners and trainers advising how to use the e-collars properly and we also support DEFRA's work with the UK Department for Business, Innovation and Skills to develop a manufacturer's charter to make sure that any e-collars on sale are made to high standards. But having listened uh, very carefully to uh, the issues raised, and I want to also emphasise that we will be keeping a very close eye on the uptake and the effectiveness of the guidance to be published in due cares, and we're also watching what is happening in other countries. But having listened very carefully to the issues that are raised, I do want to give some reassurance to the members that the government does take animal welfare very seriously indeed. And with that in mind, as a new minister, I am very sympathetic and I'm very open to us having further discussions around this issue. Um, and I've asked my officials uh, today to arrange a meeting with Christine Graham and with the animal welfare organisations and ministers to discuss further action that we can be taking around this very important issue. 
Many thanks. That concludes Christine Graham's debate on a shocking way to treat a dog. And I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm.